In this lecture, you'll learn about RAID groups and aggregates, how they relate to each other, and considerations for how best to configure them. Your disks are grouped into RAID groups, and then the RAID groups are assigned to aggregates. The RAID group configuration is an attribute of the aggregate. So I've said this in the course before, in System Manager, you'll see a page for your disks, and you'll see a page for your aggregates, but there's not a separate page for RAID groups. The RAID group configuration is found on the aggregate page because it's an attribute of your aggregates. The RAID group configuration specifies how many data drives you have for capacity and how many parity drives you have for redundancy. And if you want a refresher on RAID, that's available in my intro to SAN and NAS course. The RAID groups can be RAID 4, RAID DP, or RAID Tech in ONTAP. First up, RAID 4. RAID 4 uses a single parity drive, so it survives a single drive failure. But if two drives failed in that RAID group, then you would lose it and you'd have to restore from a backup. With RAID 4, the minimum size is two disks for aggregate zero. For normal data aggregates, the minimum size there is four disks. RAID 4 is not commonly used. It's more really there for backwards compatibility because with the history of ONTAP, when it was first available, it only supported RAID 4 and then RAID DP came out later. And obviously they needed to support the existing RAID 4 aggregates on systems that were being upgraded to, to the later versions. So there's still support for RAID 4. RAID 4, you will sometimes still see that being used though in smaller systems where it's necessary to maximize the available capacity and you don't want to have too many parity drives taking up space. The next type is RAID DP, which stands for dual parity. So dual parity meaning that there are two parity drives and because there's two parity drives, it will survive two drive failures. With RAID DP, the minimum size is three disks for aggregate zero, and for your normal data aggregates, the minimum size is five disks. RAID DP is the default type if the disk size is less than six terabytes. And finally, the last type we have is RAID Tech. The tech stands for triple erasure encoding. With, so RAID 4 was one parity drive, RAID DP is two parity drives, and RAID Tech is three parity drives. So this survives three drive failures, and RAID Tech was introduced in ONTAP 9. With RAID Tech, the minimum size is four disks for aggregate zero, and for your normal data aggregates, the minimum size is seven disks. RAID Tech is the default RAID type if the disk size is six terabytes or later or larger, sorry, and it must be used if the disk size is 10 terabytes or larger. So let's think about why that is. With larger size drives, if you do have a drive failure, it's gonna take longer to recalculate that from parity and get your spare drive going into the RAID group up and running. So because it takes longer to repair or recover from a failed drive, well, that means that it's more likely that another drive will fail during that time. It's just the laws of probability, right? The longer that something is down for, the, long, the more likely it is that, that another drive will go down at the same time as well. So because there's a higher probability of having multiple drive failures when we've got larger drives, when we are using larger drives, we want to have more redundancy there. So that's why we go for that extra parity drive with RAID Tech. Okay, converting RAID types. You can non-disruptively convert aggregates between the different RAID types. This is not commonly done though. Normally when you're setting things up in the first place, you're gonna know what RAID type you're gonna want to use. You're gonna set that and it's not gonna change. 
a reason that you maybe would convert RAID types is if you were converting aggregates with larger than four terabyte disks from RAID DP to RAID tech following upgrade to ONTAP 9. Back in ONTAP 8, RAID tech did not exist. NetApp just developed that for when ONTAP 9 came out. And again, it was because larger drives are becoming available now. And that's why there was the need to have RAID tech. A RAID DP aggregate must have at least six disks to be converted to RAID tech. And you can see the command there to do it at the command line. It's storage aggregate modify dash aggregate the aggregate name and then dash RAID type and say RAID tech that will convert it to RAID tech. All right, the disks in a RAID group must be the same type. So all the disks in the same RAID group are going to be all SAS or SATA or SSD. And they should also be the same size and speed. The size and speed is not enforced, but it's really important that you do that because if you do have drives of different size or speed in the same RAID group, then they're all going to operate at the size or speed of the lowest drive so for example say that you've got a raid group made up of one terabyte drives and then it's also got a 500 gigabyte drive in there then you're only going to have the capacity of 500 gig for all the drives you're going to be wasting a load of space so you don't want to do that you want to make sure that they are all one terabyte so that way you get the full capacity used and it's the same with speed as well if you've got one drive in the raid group that's operating at a lower speed they're all going to run at that lower speed so in your raid group you want your disk to be the same type the same size and the same speed you also want to have spare drives available in the system as well now your spare drives are not assigned to a particular aggregate that would be really inefficient. Your spare drives are at the cluster level and they are able to replace a failed drive that happens anywhere in the cluster. So if you've got a drive that fails in aggregate one or a drive that fails in aggregate two, then the spare drives are pooled for the entire cluster as a whole. Both aggregate one and aggregate two have got the same access to those spare drives. So your spare drives can be used if you do have a drive failure to replace that failed drive. The other reason we have spare drives is if we want to create a new normal aggregate. So if a drive fails, then the system will automatically replace it with a spare disk of the same type, size, and speed, and the data will be rebuilt from our RAID parity. There will be a performance degradation until the rebuild is complete because the system has to think to do the rebuild from the parity information. You should have at least two spare disks of each type, size, and speed of your disks in the system. Okay, let's look at our aggregates now. So an aggregate can be made up of one or of multiple RAID groups. If you've got a small aggregate, then it's going to have just one RAID group in there. You wouldn't have a need to have multiple groups. Larger aggregates will have multiple RAID groups, so I'll explain why as we go through the next few slides. The aim is to get a good balance between capacity and redundancy in your aggregates. So looking at the diagram here, you can see we've got aggregate zero, which has just got three disks, and the, the yellow drives are parity drives, green is a data drive. So I can see that I'm using RAID DP here. And then we've got, and that's made up of just one RAID group. Then we've got aggregate one, and it's made up of two different RAID groups. Now, in the diagram here, there's only five disks in each RAID group. In real life, you'd have more than five disks. I've just put five there just to save room on the slide. So maybe we would have 16 drives in each of the RAID groups. So if you do have a large aggregate with lots of drives in there, it is going to be made up of multiple RAID groups to give you enough redundancy to give you enough parity drives. Let's cover that in a bit more detail. So you could have an aggregate made up of a single RAID DP group of 16 disks. So RAID DP, you've got two parity drives. That would give you 16 data drives for capacity and two parity drives for redundancy. And that example is a good balance between capacity and redundancy. So the actual, the total capacity there is, say that we're using one terabyte drives, 
that would be 16 terabytes. But only 14 terabytes would be usable because two of our drives are being used for parity. But we do want to have those parity drives there to give us redundancy in case we have drive failure. The more drives there are, the higher the chance of multiple failures at the same time. That's just the laws of probability. We wouldn't want an aggregate with 48 drives to have just a single RAID group because that would give us 46 data drives and two parity drives. There's too much chance of having multiple drive failures. So again, the more drives that you've got, the more chance there is of having multiple failures at the same time. So with more drives, with more data drives, you want to have more parity drives there as well in case you do have failures. And the way we do that in ONTAP is through the use of our RAID groups. So for our example, we had the the 48 drives. We don't want to just have that made up of one RAID group of 48 drives. That would give us 46 data drives and two parity drives. There's not enough redundancy. A better thing to do, a better balance, would be to use three RAID groups of size 16 disks each. That would give us 42 data drives and six parity drives. So you see there, we're giving up some capacity. If we use just one RAID group, then we would get 46 data drives. So again, using one terabyte disks for the example, if we had one RAID group, we would have 46 data drives. So that would give us 46 terabytes of usable capacity, two terabytes being used for parity. There's not enough redundancy there. So what we would really do is out of those 48 drives, we would split them into three RAID groups. We want the RAID groups to be equal size. So we would use 16 each. There's two parity drives in each of those RAID groups. So that gives us 42 data drives, 42 terabytes of usable capacity. So down from the 46 we had before, but now we've got six parity drives. So we've got more safety against multiple failures now. So that gives us a good balance between the capacity and the redundancy. We also need to consider performance when we are creating our aggregates as well. The more disks that we have in an aggregate, the better the performance because we can read and write from multiple drives at the same time. So sometimes it would be recommended to add more drives than are actually necessary to hold the capacity of data. So say we've got five terabytes worth of data, just to pick a, a first number that comes into my head, maybe we wouldn't make the aggregate just five terabytes in size. Maybe we would make it 10 terabytes in size knowing that we're actually never going to use that other five terabytes. The reason that we're doing it is to get more disks into the aggregate so we can read and write to them at the same time, and that's going to give us the better performance. So it depends on the particular application, the particular workload that you're running. It can be a reason to make the aggregate larger than you actually need, putting more disks in there to get that better performance. Next thing to talk about is active standby systems. On smaller entry level two node systems, something that's sometimes done is to assign all disks to a particular node so you can make one large aggregate. So say we've got an entry level system, it's got the internal disks in there. Let's say it's an entry level platform with 24 internal drives. By default, you would have two data aggregates there. So let's say that it's split into 12 and 12. If we're using RAID DP, because we've got two aggregates, we would end up with four, pa four parity drives being used, which would give us 20 usable disks. Well, you could get higher capacity utilization by just using one aggregate. In fact, a better example would be entry-level system with 12 disks, okay? So you've got 12 disks, rather than splitting it into two aggregates of size six each and having to have four parity drives, you could just have one larger aggregate with the 12 drives and now you've only got two parity drives rather than four. So that gives you more usable capacity. The system will be acting as active standby if you do that because you've got one aggregate and aggregates are always owned by one and only one node. So let's say it's owned by node one. Well, it will be node one that is active for it. Node two is going to be standby. So you're not going to get as good performance because you're only using one of your nodes rather than using two of your nodes. You will be able to access the aggregate through network interfaces on either node, but the client read and write requests over the SAS connection will only be processed by one node. 
Okay, and the last thing to tell you here is about growing and shrinking aggregates. You can grow, but you cannot shrink aggregates on the fly. So you can have an aggregate that is currently in use. It's got volumes on there where clients are reading and writing the data. You could add disks to that aggregate. It will be completely non-disruptive and transparent to your clients. So you can grow aggregates on the fly. You cannot shrink aggregates on the fly though. If you did want to make an aggregate smaller, you can still do it non-disruptively. What you would need to do is any of the volume, all the volumes that were on that aggregate, you'd have to move them to a different aggregate. You would then destroy the original aggregate and recreate a new one with a smaller size made up of less disks. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also check out my NetApp storage complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.